In the first week of September 1665, bubonic plague was raging through the streets of London. The death rate in the city had reached unprecedented levels. Four months into the epidemic, almost 7,000 Londoners a week were dying. It had already killed more than 30,000, around 8% of the city's population. Each week, the death rate increased remorselessly with no end in sight. With over a 1,000 people dying every single day, the onslaught began to overwhelm attempts to cope with and control the outbreak. A brutal system of shutting up had been established in an attempt to prevent the disease spreading. Entire families were physically locked into their homes by the authorities if just one of the household was identified as having plague. But by September, there were so many cases, it was impossible to police them. The system of shutting up was abandoned to the horror of the famous diarist Samuel Pepys, who had bravely stayed in London when many of the wealthy had left. Pepys saw people stumbling through the streets and was terrified he was coming into contact with those who, in his words, had plague upon them. Another famous writer of the time, Daniel Defoe, describes the scenes that unfolded on London streets as order collapsed. Defoe's book about the Great Plague is thought to be based on the experiences of his uncle, Henry Foe. We're told that at the height of the outbreak, Henry Foe was holed up in his house right here on Oldgate High Street. It would have been where the tube station is. Now, like other better off people, he lived on the wide main street, but from his window, he could see Harrow Alley still here. This was one of London's infamous back alley slums, where body lice and human flea infestations allowed the disease to run rampant. This is what Defoe tells us was going on in this very spot at the height of the plague. Scarce a day or night passed, but some dismal thing happened at the end of that Harrow Alley, which was a place full of poor. Throngs of people would burst out, most of them women, making a dreadful clamour, a mixture of screeches and crying. On one occasion, Henry Foe saw a man with plague, overwhelmed by insufferable pain, run naked out here from Harrow Alley and set off down the high street. He was chased by five or six women and children, crying out for him to come back and trying to persuade others to help them stop him. But no one, not even his family, was prepared to touch him. And Henry Foe, watching from his window over there, saw them all disappear off down the street. By September, the city authorities were also struggling to deal with the dead. There weren't enough dead carts to collect all the bodies each night for burial. A crisis made worse because the carters themselves were also dying of plague. Desperate families resorted to carrying their own loved ones to the graveyards. But many churchyards were already full, including the one outside Samuel Pepys's local church, St. Olav, Hart Street. This is the street where Pepys was living in September 1665, Seething Lane. Now, Pepys's home was just down there. It's long gone, replaced by modern buildings, but his parish church still survives. This grim gate is the one Pepys would have walked through to get to his church. But even this foreboding gate paled in comparison to what Pepys found on the other side. 
he tells us that so many plague victims were buried here, one on top of the other, that the ground level actually rose. And it frightened him so much, he refused to walk through the churchyard anymore. Churchyards across London were said to be three feet higher than they were before the Great Plague. Incredibly, the level of this churchyard is still raised. I have to walk down these steps to get into Pepys's church. I'm meeting historian Vanessa Harding to discover what the church's burial registers reveal about life in Pepys's parish at the height of the epidemic. These are the parish registers, the burial registers, from the period that Pepys lived here, and it's extremely good, it's extremely rich in detail for the period of the plague. Unusually, the parish clerk marks every single plague burial with the letter P. You can see the first page, there are quite a few plague deaths, but there are quite a few that aren't. But by the time we turn the page and get into August and then into September, you can see that almost every death is a plague death. And people would have seen the plague moving through a family, clearing yes. an entire household in a, yes. in a fortnight. Mm -hmm. And presumably that's what you see through the whole parish, that the place begins to, yeah. it feels like the apocalypse. Yes, it, it must have done. I mean, particularly, I think, in some ways, because it's a wealthy parish, people may have thought they would escape. I mean, it's, it's overwhelmingly clear from this book that once it gets going, even in a wealthy parish like this, no one is safe, that every part of London is affected. Yes, and there are some very dramatic and tragic stories here. So, for example, on the 10th of September, Zachary, the son of Edmund Poole, died of plague and was buried in the churchyard. And then the next day, his brother Henry, the son of Edmund Poole, also died of plague. Zachary was about 12 and Henry was about 14. I mean, quite hard to think about as a parent. Zachary is a year older than my son and in 24 hours, Edmund Poole has buried two of his kids. That's right, but I'm afraid it gets worse. Just a few days later, we have Elizabeth, daughter of Edmund Poole, and her brother Edward, son of Edmund Poole. Both of them died of plague, 20th of September. And then we have, on the 21st of September, John, the son of Edmund Poole, buried in the churchyard. All of these marked as plague burials. So in 11 days, Edmund Poole's buried five of his children. Yes, probably all five of his children. Yeah. We don't think he had any more. Wow. And then, just a few days later, on the 25th of September, Edmund Poole himself dies of plague and is buried in the churchyard. Is there a mother? Or does he have a wife? We know that his wife's called Elizabeth, and there is an Elizabeth Poole, a widow, living in the parish uh, in March the following year. We find her as a householder. So I think it's quite likely she is the widow, the mother of this family almost worse to have survived it yes. and having lost five children and your husband. Yes. Wow. Wow. But the fatalities were still rising and soon the epidemic would reach its terrible peak. In mid-September 1665, four and a half months since the epidemic began engulfing London, the plague reached its peak. In just one week, between the 12th and the 18th of September, plague killed 7,165 Londoners. Deaths were reported across the city in 126 parishes. And those are just the official figures. Many cases of plague were either misdiagnosed or deliberately passed off as something else. The real figure for that week was probably 10,000 cases, more than 1,400 a day. But as deaths in the capital spiked, it wasn't only Londoners who were suffering. The disease had spread to other towns and cities across the south and east of England. Worst affected were those with trade links to London. The plague carried there by the flow of people and goods. Essex cloth trading towns suffered dreadfully. In Braintree, 865 people died 
a third of the population. In Colchester, it was even worse. There were over 5,000 plague deaths here, half the population, a higher proportion than any other major town, including London. From there, the disease was transmitted to the university town of Cambridge, where, in a foreshadowing of the events of 2020, the students were sent home. Maritime trade with London took the disease to ports, including Portsmouth and Southampton, and ships even carried it as far north as Newcastle. In all these places, the graph of deaths was heading upwards in the hot summer of 1665. Death rates peaking in late summer was a pattern seen in earlier plague outbreaks in Britain. The relationship between the weather and the plague was noticed by William Boghurst, an apothecary who worked here on Drury Lane throughout the Great Plague, where the outbreak began. Now, his shop would have been a stall inside this pub. It's not the original building, but in fact, there has been a White Hart pub here since the 15th century. Apothecaries were early pharmacists. They dispensed complex herbal remedies and performed simple medical treatments. Boghurst noticed death rates changed according to the seasons. They increased if hot conditions were followed by rain, while frosty weather caused a massive decline in fatalities. This is the opposite of infections like flu and coronaviruses. It seems the plague thrived in warm, humid conditions, but it didn't like it too hot, too cold or too dry. The records show the summer of 1665 was both hot and humid. Could this relationship, along with the massive death toll in summer 1665, be related to the culprits that I think are responsible for spreading the plague, human body lice and fleas? Well, Raksha has gone to investigate. I've come to meet Professor James Logan at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to find out if these insects' behaviour changes at different times of year. In 1665, we're seeing this spike of plague cases in the summer. Is there a link between temperature and insect behaviour? Yeah, absolutely. Temperature is hugely important to any insects, including fleas. So we've actually set up an experiment and what we're going to do is have a look at the activity of the fleas to see whether they're more active or less active in the higher or lower temperature. James has had one set of fleas kept at an autumn temperature of 14 degrees centigrade for two days. And some other fleas have spent two days at a hot summer temperature of 28 degrees. Ah. Okay. These are the ones that were kept at 28 degrees, okay. and these were kept at 14. Brilliant. OK, thanks Thank very much. You. Right, well, this tube certainly feels colder. OK. Um, and it's just been brought out of the, the cold conditions. So these guys, you can see they're crawling about, they're jumping around, very, very active, whereas these guys are pretty slow. In fact, lots of them are just not moving at all. So you can see that the ones that would be in the cold conditions, in cold weather, would just be sort of chilling out. Whereas the ones that you can see have been kept at 28 degrees are super active. So does this explain why we see this big spike in the play being transmitted in the summer of 1665? Yeah, I think that is absolutely um, a, a real possibility. At that sort of temperature, in the height of summer, these guys are going to be jumping around the place, they're going to be jumping on and off the host, they're going to be feeding more, and it's actually a bit more than that as well. They'll be reproducing a little bit quicker, and I think the transmission would have been, would have been quite high. The other plague-transmitting insects, body lice, are also far less active and breed more slowly in cool temperatures. And this helps explain why the death rate in London finally began to decline a summer turned to autumn in 1665. In the week to the 25th of September, 5,533 Londoners died of plague, around 1,500 fewer than the previous week. 
it was a glimmer of hope that the worst had passed. William Boghurst was one of the few medical men left in London by this point. Most doctors and surgeons had joined the great exodus of professionals who'd fled the city. At the time, this cowardice horrified the abandoned people of London. But because doctors didn't then understand bacterial disease and had no drugs to treat plague, even the ones who stayed didn't much help the situation. John Sargent has headed to the St. Bartholomew Hospital Pathology Museum to see what treatments doctors attempted. Among the 5,000 medical specimens kept here, there are some from 19th century plague epidemics. This is a rat infected by the plague that's gruesome, kept in formaldehyde. And this is even more poignant. This is a human lung from a plague victim. I'm meeting Kevin Goodman, an expert in early medicine and surgery, who's collected a vast array of 17th century medical instruments. Well, this is an amazing collection of, of objects, some of them. I must say rather sinister, but these are all medical tools of the trade at the time. Yes. So what does that do? That's a flame. Now, a flame was normally used for bleeding, for opening a vein. For treatment of buboes, you would perforate right. the bubo. So if you had the bubo here, you'd just stick it in you? Yes. Oh, but this is all incredibly painful. Oh, yes. Oh. OK, so how would you get the pus out? I would then heat a cup up, place it on the bubo, and then, as it cooled, the vacuum would draw out all the nasty pus full of germs. Oh, right. Right, so you'd put this on, so this would yeah. go through there. Yeah. And the idea is to break the bubo. That's the, yeah. that's the bit. OK, right, so they would think they were doing something useful. So what else have we got? What are all these things here? I've got a selection of cauterising irons here. You could heat that up, place it into the middle of the bubo to burn it. Horrible, isn't it? Making it so hot that the flesh burns. Yes, the pain would have been agonising. And don't forget, there's going to be no pain control with this. You have to just bite down and endure it. But would any of these methods actually work? No. If you're going to start cutting into buboes or burning into them, you're going to start letting out lots of germ-infested pus. You're going to increase the risk of the people catching it. Also, you're increasing the risk of infection. Right, so actually, they're making things worse with all this stuff. Indeed. At the time, people would be so fearful, there'd be so much terror, but they just sort of say, give me anything you can to help me, because they were so desperate. It is a time of desperation, complete and utter. I thought nothing could be more terrible than having the plague. But it seems being treated for it could have been worse. While these 17th century medical interventions may have done more harm than good, we're about to discover if other methods for controlling plague may have been more effective than we ever imagined. As the weather cooled in the autumn of 1665, plague deaths in London continued to fall. By mid-October, four and a half thousand fewer people a week were dying compared to a month earlier. Most deaths were now in the eastern parishes of Oldgate and Whitechapel, which were poorer parishes outside the city walls. The disease had passed like a wave from the west of the city to the east. In the western parishes where the outbreak began, the vulnerable had already died, and those who'd recovered now had some resistance to the disease. It's thought that up to 80,000 people had fled London, 
20% of the population. And among those who'd stayed, about one in five had died. For those still alive, the city had changed beyond all recognition. This was observed by Puritan minister Thomas Vincent, one of the few who continued to preach to his congregation and visit the sick. He wrote that the terror of the disease had broken societal bonds and drained people's hearts of love and pity. He was horrified to see families abandoning their loved ones. In Spitalfields, his household of eight had managed to escape the disease, but then, he tells us, plague came in dreadfully upon them. Over the course of two weeks, three of his household fell ill and died. A story which was echoed in thousands of homes across the city, many of which now stood empty. The Lord Mayor now had to somehow deal with these infected houses. I'm going to take a look at the orders he issued detailing how they should be disinfected. I'm interested to discover if the methods would have been effective against the human fleas and body lice we now know spread the plague. There were instructions about what to do with these abandoned, infected houses, and the first was to keep them uninhabited for 40 days. Now, that's very effective against human body lice. If they don't eat for 40 days, they die. But there were other instructions as well. Each infected house was to be fumed, washed, and whited with lime. Now, whited with lime means whitewashed, and fumed, we have a description of what that is here, and the recipe for fuming is to take saltpeter, amber, brimstone, each of two parts, juniper one part, mix them in a powder, put thereof upon a red-hot iron or coals a little at once. A Frenchman, James Angier, had introduced this fumigation recipe to London, claiming the smoke successfully decontaminated houses in Paris. Now, I'm very curious to know if fuming or washing with lime could possibly help in controlling the plague. It seems unlikely that whitewash, commonly painted outside and inside houses in the 17th century, would have much effect on the plague bacteria. Hi, Sam. So Raksha's putting it to the test with Dr. Sam Wilcox. So what we have here are these three wooden tiles. There are pseudo 17th century walls, aren't they? That's right. Sam coats each tile with a spray of bacteria. It's similar to plague, but not deadly, and then allows them to dry. The spray is going to simulate a cough or a body fluids that have landed on the surface. We treat one with modern antibac, one with water, and one with our lime wash. So let's see if this works. Then we swab down each one and transfer them to agar plates to see if any bacteria will grow. Two days later, the results are in. So here are the plates. Oh, let's have a look then. That's our antibac. That's right. This Let's is our, our household antibac spray. And there's no colony growth at all on that plate, which is what we were hoping for. It's clean as a whistle. Our next plate was the sterile water that we sprayed onto the tiles. And you can actually see some colonies growing there quite nicely on the plate. I can clearly see spots on that. So that's the bacteria growing. That's right, yeah. Right, so what about our final okay. experiment? Well, the lime wash did kill all the bacteria. Yeah. I can't see any, any colonies on there at all. It's as good as the anti spray that we use nowadays. It really is. So they kind of knew what they were doing, didn't they? It worked, it worked. I'm going to start lime washing my kitchen now. <laughs> yeah, else, yeah. <laughs> In the 17th century, they wouldn't have known how it worked. But amazingly, they'd learnt from experience. Lime washing houses control disease. But what about fumigation? Our experiment this time is being carried out in a very different location. A farm shed on the South Downs by pyrotechnics expert Mike Sansom. 
Hello, Mike. Hi there, how are you doing? Oh, talk about plague and pestilence. You've definitely got a flood here, haven't you? I know, shocking day, isn't it? <laughs> I don't say this very often, but I've got fleas. Oh, nice. <laughs> but what I wanted to do is to see if we can recreate 17th century fumigation. I want to know if it was really effective in killing fleas and lice, because we know that these are the carrier of the plague. Right, so I've got the chemicals that I know were used for fumigation in the 17th century. Brimstone, first of all, sulphur. So the reason it was called brimstone is because it was found on the brim of volcanoes. And then we've got the saltpeter, potassium nitrate, which is a strong oxidizing agent. And I know these two burn really well together because they're the main components of gunpowder. They burn quite ferociously and then produces quite a noxious gas called sulphur dioxide. Let's do it. This shed will act as our infested 17th century room. It's a lovely little shed you've got here. The lid of the flea container is a porous mesh that would allow in the fumes. So it's this plume of gas coming up at a steady rate. It's filling this whole shed up now, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. They certainly don't look very active now, do they? No. Oh, I just saw one drop. Oh, they're, oh all yeah, they're all dropping! They're all now. dropping! They're dropping like fleas. Let's have a look. Yeah, right. Woohoo! Smoke is there. Oh gosh, they're definitely dead, aren't they? I think that's worked really well. It has. I mean, it's pretty spectacular, isn't it, that in the 17th century, they were using this method to fumigate houses. That's, that's incredible. It's a really effective insecticide. They were getting rid of the things, the fleas and the lice, that were killing and passing on the plague to other people. Amazing. They didn't know how it was working, but this simple disinfection method would have helped normality slowly to return to London. And in late October 1665, some life returned to the streets. But things had changed. Diarist Samuel Pepys says he walked to the Royal Exchange and heard only conversations about who had died and who was still ill. He also tells us there were still plague victims in the streets, although by now the death rate was heading steadily downwards. From the September peak of over a thousand deaths a day, by October the 30th, plague fatalities had dropped to a thousand deaths a week. The declining death rate encouraged the many thousands who'd fled to the countryside to begin returning to London. Daniel Defoe says they were tired of being away from London so long and were so eager to get back, they flocked into the city here without any thought or fear. This influx caused a brief spike in deaths in early November because, as more people came back to the city, there were also more people vulnerable to catching the infection. But from mid-November, plague deaths fell every week. By mid-winter 1665, the cold weather had reduced the death rate to around 40 a day. After a year, the Great Plague epidemic in London was coming to an end. Finally, after Christmas, King Charles and his court returned to his palace at Westminster. They'd spent most of the year in Oxford, which, unlike many towns in southern England, hadn't seen a single case of plague. And that's probably because royal guards were posted day and night on each of the four bridges that led in and out of town, and they didn't let anyone in. This was a highly effective form of quarantine, and King Charles seems to have had a pleasant time in Oxford, even managing to get one of his mistresses pregnant. But his abandonment of his capital in its hour of need didn't go down well with its inhabitants. While London had now seen the worst of the epidemic, the rest of the country was not so lucky. In the spring of 1666, towns across Britain were hit by plague again. 
Like Oxford, many towns around the country tried to quarantine themselves. They stopped all trade with London and armed volunteers prevented strangers from entering towns and villages. But they often weren't as successful as the royal troops. Plague again swept through towns like Colchester and Cambridge, which had suffered terribly the previous year. And this time, the outbreaks were even more severe. But it was the villagers of Eam, deep in the Derbyshire Peak District, who would become famous for their heroic response to the disease. I'm about to find out what they did. Plague arrived here in Eam in early September 1665. It was brought in a shipment of clothing that was delivered to a tailor who lived in the village. The clothes in the shipment probably contained plague-infected body lice. It began a chain of events which put all 700 of the village's inhabitants at risk. By December 1665, 28 of them had died. Just like in London, the cold of winter brought about a significant reduction in the deaths. The disease bubbled along, two or three people died each month, but the people in the village were relieved, thinking the worst was over. But as spring turned to summer, the number of cases rocketed. A story of extraordinary heroism and self-sacrifice now unfolded in Eam over the summer of 1666. The instigator was the village vicar, the Reverend William Mompesson. When Mompesson realised that winter hadn't put an end to the outbreak in the village, he sent his wife Catherine and his children away to stay with friends in Yorkshire. But Catherine returned to support her husband. In late May 1666, Mompesson made a decision that would have terrible consequences for everyone in the village. To discover what happened, I'm meeting Joan Plant, whose family have lived in Eam since the time of the plague. Tell me about this extraordinary decision made by Mompesson. He'd seen instances of plague in the country before. He got together with the previous minister, Stanley, um, and they made a plan. They would close the church, close the churchyard, and close the village. And, and this is what Montpesson had to ask the village to do, simply to, to contain the disease. And they agreed, which was just incredible. What does that mean to close a village back then? Well, it, it, it means you put a border the whole way around. Nobody goes, comes in and nobody goes out. Tell me about the significance of this particular place. So Mont Pesson's Well is a running water well and this was the northern boundary point when they closed the village and the village people would leave money here for the provisions that would be brought along the road from the Earl of Devonshire and surrounding villages. Families could have chosen to flee the infected village to save themselves, just as happened in London. But... Incredibly, they chose to stay, hoping to prevent the disease spreading and so save the neighbouring villages and towns from the same fate. I think the older I get, the more I think about that and think how brave and courageous they, they must have been, because it, it's almost like facing a certain death. The villagers knew the terrible sacrifice they were making because dozens of their neighbours had already fallen ill and the contagion was accelerating. The price they paid for their selfless decision can be seen in the parish church registers. So this is the record of deaths in Eam during the period of the plague. So you can see here it says, here follows the names with the numbers of persons who died of the plague. And we start with the first victim, George Vickers, in September the 7th of 1665. But it really gets going in the summer of the next year. If I turn to June, we see we've got 21 deaths. Then in July, there are 58 deaths. And then turning to August, we get 80 deaths. This entire page 
filled with families completely wiped out. In a small village, it's extraordinary, and that trajectory is the same thing we saw in London in the summer of the previous year. Of course, it's an extraordinary document in terms of public health, in terms of data about how the epidemic spread. But the other thing that's so overwhelming when you look at it is the number of deaths in a small community. All these people, friends and family, it must have been absolutely horrific living through this, completely terrifying. This isolated burial plot on a hillside overlooking the village gives some sense of the horrific scale of these tragedies. I'm visiting with Dr Lilith Whittles, who's investigated if the plague in Eam was spread here in the same way as it spread in London. Seven members of the Hancock family are buried here, near where they lived. Six children and their father, who all died within one week of each other. Only the mother, Elizabeth, survived. It's a pretty bleak image, isn't it? Elizabeth Hancock up here. She's not doing fancy gravestones or anything. Right. She's digging holes and dragging her family members into yeah. them. And there's no funeral, there's no vicar, no. there's no mourners. No. It's just her. Well, the social distancing um, measures that the villagers had taken meant that they weren't coming to funerals and weren't helping out with burials. They couldn't. So what you're able to do with the computer is simulate what if the epidemic was spread by rats? What if it was spread in different ways? And can figure out what the most likely way of it spreading was. Exactly that. And what do you find? The most likely explanation for the transmission was the plague being transmitted from human to human through um, ectoparasites such as human lice and human fleas. For a long time, there's been this story that the villagers of Eam kind of pointlessly quarantined themselves. They'd quarantined themselves against a disease that was not spread by humans, it was spread by rats. Yeah. And actually, your modelling suggests that what they did was really important. Absolutely. If the plague was spread by human-to-human -human contact through their ectoparasites, then by distancing themselves from the surrounding area, they stopped the spread of plague to places like Sheffield, where if an infected person had started an outbreak there, we could have seen many, many more deaths like we did in the London um, outbreak. So I kind of imagine Elizabeth Hancock up here digging these graves and... I guess now at least we can see she is doing something really important. She saved a lot of lives. Absolutely. They, they all did something extraordinary, the villagers of Eam. Wow. So now we know Eam's quarantine was both heroic and worthwhile. The village's last plague victim was buried on the 1st of November, 1666. In total, 257 people died of the disease, about 40% of the population. William Momperson, the vicar who instigated the village's quarantine, also paid a heavy price. His wife, Catherine, who'd returned to support her husband's work in Eam, died of plague in August. As the vicar's wife, she was the only person allowed to be buried in the churchyard. While the plague raged in Eam in the summer of 1666, London was reporting few cases. Fatalities had dropped by 95% and life was returning to normal. But then, unbelievably, the capital was hit by another tragedy. In September, the Great Fire destroyed much of the walled city. Although it's widely believed that this burnt the plague out of London, the statistics suggest it was a coincidence. The epidemic was already ending by the time the flames took hold. We'll never know for certain how many Londoners died during the Great Plague but the official estimate of around 70,000 is undoubtedly too low. Many cases of plague were misidentified and many burials went unrecorded. So it's actually thought 
that over 100,000 Londoners died during the plague. That's around a quarter of the population. The last plague death recorded in London was in 1679, and there were no other outbreaks in Britain until the early 1900s when the third plague pandemic swept the world. From 1900, there were plague deaths in port towns, including Glasgow, Cardiff, and Liverpool. The most recent plague outbreak in Britain was in Suffolk in 1918. None of the outbreaks of plague in 20th century Britain turned into epidemics. And that's because modern hygiene means that there aren't the body lice or the human fleas around to fuel the spread. But plague isn't the only pandemic we face. And in fact, coronavirus itself is only one of the many diseases that have swept the world since the 17th century. Through most of human history, disease has killed far more than war or natural disasters. Epidemics like cholera, smallpox and tuberculosis killed hundreds of millions in the 20th century alone. Modern medicine has helped bring about a massive reduction in these ancient pandemic diseases. But as COVID-19 reminds us, new diseases emerge all the time. And in fact, with modern travel, population growth, and environmental destruction, we now face more outbreaks than ever before. In 1918, the Spanish flu killed up to 50 million people. Since 1980, we've suffered SARS, MERS, Ebola, and the deadliest, AIDS, which has so far killed an estimated 32 million people. And now, there's COVID-19. The methods that we use to respond initially to these disasters are the same ones we used during the Great Plague, quarantine and social distancing. But we now also have modern science, which has successfully controlled and in some cases defeated almost every disease humanity has faced. New diseases will continue to emerge, but unlike our ancestors during the Great Plague, we are now in a much better position to fight back. <laughs>